Chapter 28 is split into new voiceovers. Uh, chapter 28A starts out with politics, California style. Uh, the, in the 1930s, uh, the number of California voters registered as Democrats, well, let's just start with the year 1930. Um, the, in the year 1930, the number of California voters registered as Democrats was only 22% of the two-party registration. By 1936, it rose to 60%, as the Republicans were then uh, uh, dubbed as the party of the Depression, so to speak. Uh, even though the Depression converted the California electorate to the Democratic Party with respect to registration, the voters themselves, when they went to the polls, when the rubber met the road, elected heavy majorities of Republicans to state government between 1942 and uh, 1958. Uh, during this time, nonpartisanship uh, was, was still favoring the Republicans. Remember, at this time, California had this crazy cross-filing system where candidates could be endorsed by both the Democratic and Republican Party uh, machine, so to speak. And the whole idea of cross-filing, of course, was to defeat the power of the railroads, you remember from before, in the progressive movement of the 19-teens. Uh, much of this, no doubt, had to do, in fact, with California's peculiar cross-party filing system, uh, which we discussed uh, earlier. Uh, Republicans were generally better funded and usually had the support of the major California newspapers in elections. Uh, the cross-filing system and other anti-party laws uh, implemented in the day of the progressives were designed to destroy the power of the corrupt political machines, most notably, of course, the Southern Pacific Railroad. That's something we discussed before. This had the unintended consequence of weakening the two-party system in California. And so with gaps in the two-party system in California and weaknesses, uh, these laws, and you know, this was certainly nothing that Hiram Johnson and his progressive cohorts could have anticipated, I guess, in the 19-teens. Uh, these laws uh, opened the way for non-traditional political organizations to fill the power void. And uh, your authors list three specifically, special interest lobbyists, which still have great influence in California politics today, indeed all of politics, professional campaign management firms, which is a California invention, and informal party organizations. So let's start with the lobbyists first. Uh, they are often referred to as the fourth branch of government, uh, or often as the third house of a legislature, if a legislature, in fact, is a bicameral legislature. Uh, a lobbyist uh, is all about the power of a person or an organization to represent special interests with a whole lot of money to influence the outcome of legislation that's going through a state house. Uh, in this era of the 1930s to 1940s, and even through the early 1950s, for about 20 years, Arthur H. Samish was the king of the California lobbyists. Uh, in 1938, the Sacramento Grand Jury used a private detective to investigate Samish's activities. I guess they couldn't find, up, uh, find anything they really could uh, bring him uh, up on charges for. In 1949, Collier's magazine published an expose called The Secret Boss of California. And what's interesting is that, you know, Samish was really quite blatant about this. This is a picture of him uh, sitting in his suite in 1949 for the Collier's magazine interview in the Senator Hotel in Sacramento, uh, sitting there with a the ventriloquist dummy, which was labeled Mr. Legislature. And so basically he pretended like the legislature would do any kind of talking that Samish wanted the legislature to do in order to get bills passed that were uh, of keen interest to the people that Samish represented with a whole bunch of money. Um, and that was the photo you saw in the Senator Hotel. Um, this expose compelled the California legislature then to pass laws requiring lobby lobbyists to register and to file monthly financial statements. Uh, Samish failed to report income and expenditures to the federal government. He was convicted in 1953 of income tax evasion and served two years in prison. Uh, the state assembly then reorganized its committee system to eliminate Samish's influence uh, specifically. Uh, no doubt lobbyists still, of course, uh, influence uh, committees on the state senate and the state assembly today. I think we all pretty much know that. Uh, then the next thing they talked about in your book, um, uh, Rawls and Bean, were the, uh, was the advent of professional campaign management firms. This is a distinctive contribution to American politics by California. Uh, the first one was called Campaigns, Inc., uh, 
and, and it was founded by Sacramento reporter Clem Whitaker and Leona Baxter, uh, who was a widow who worked for the Reading Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they managed the 1934 Republican uh, smear campaign against gubernatorial candidate Upton Sinclair. We talked about that earlier. Uh, these two in 1938, uh, Whitaker and Baxter were married in 1938. They had 20 years of success in the professional campaign management firm Business. Uh, the two of them, Whitaker and Baxter, accepted no campaign that was not in accord with their own political views. Um, and as their financial success increased, their views became more conservative. Uh, it was basically, that's where the money came from, so that's uh, the way they tilted uh, politically. Dozens of such firms followed, which are still influential today. And then the third thing your authors spoke about uh, in the beginning of this chapter was the informal party organization. Uh, the first one was formed by Republicans in 1933 uh, when their party wasn't doing very well during the Depression. It was called the California Republican Assembly. Uh, the Democrats at first were not uh, really able to be as successful in forming such um, uh, informal party organizations. But about 20 years later, uh, due to the enthusiasm circulating uh, because of the uh, nomination of Adlai Stevens, Stevenson, who was the governor of Illinois for the uh, Democratic uh, presidency, uh, uh, then Democratic clubs started to form around the nation and indeed in California to support uh, his candidacy. This would have been in 1952. Um, although his presidential candidacy failed in 1952 because it was ultimately um, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Republican, that won the presidency, uh, the next year in 1953, the Democratic, uh, California Democratic Council was formed. Now we need to talk about uh, the groundbreaking governorship of uh, Earl Warren. Um, Earl Warren was born in L.A. in 1891. He grew up in Bakersfield. Uh, he studied law at UC Berkeley uh, and became eventually California's Attorney General. He was considered a Republican progressive, sort of in the mold of Hiram Johnson back in the 19-teens. Um, he, w he became state attorney general, as I mentioned, and he was elected in 1938, it would have been, and then in 1939 he took office. He was elected to his first term as governor in 1942, and he was riding the tide of the improving California economy uh, in World War II. Uh, he was nominated again to run by both parties. This is because of this cross-filing system. He was not nominated by both major political parties to run again for governor in 1946 and he is the only governor in California history to win the governorship in the primary election. So in 1946 he was re-elected but he didn't even have to go to the November election. He was elected in the primary. That's quite extraordinary. Uh, in 1945, Warren proposed a state compulsory health insurance law. Uh, pressure from the California Medical Association and the conservative operatives uh, in uh, politics in California ensured the defeat of this measure. So uh, this whole business going on currently with the Affordable Care Act at the federal level uh, is really, in some respects, nothing new because anytime somebody wanted to make sure that all people were insured, uh, the special interests... Uh, that would lose money uh, on this kind of a proposition were certainly there to lobby against it. Uh, Warren increased, uh, requested an increase in the gasoline tax in 1947. This was to expand and improve California highways. This was opposed by the oil and trucking interests, but eventually a compromise was worked out so that he didn't get the amount <coughs> of a gasoline tax that he wanted. Uh, so he uh, backed off on what he wanted in order to make a compromise. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, philosophy on the part of Warren. He felt that the oil and gas industries and the transportation and trucking industries were short-sighted in their opposition because if you were able to have a high enough tax, it would expand the highway system, which would ultimately uh, benefit the oil industry and anything having to do with motor vehicles because it would ensure their growth if there were more and better highways. Warren won a third and unprecedented term for governor in 1950, and he was a contender then for the Republican presidential nomination uh, in 1952. But of course, the uh, Republican nominee ended up being Dwight D. Eisenhower, the uh, uh, decorated World War II uh, Army uh, general. That is the end of Part 28A.